packed uh, panel here. Uh, we've got uh, Cheryl, who's served at both um, Salesforce for, for about seven years, and now is starting at a smaller company. We've got Sid, who's uh, built a company of about 500 people, all remote, um, and he's got some really interesting things to say about that. Uh, and then Mike from Envision, which is also another uh, remote company, the kind of the best practices. Uh, so really excited to, to do this. Um, I, my, I, I started this because I, I run a podcast called Crazy Wisdom, where I interview people about the relationship between stress and creativity. Uh, and so this is kind of in that, in that whole vein. Uh, so we're going to start with just some brief introductions for everybody. Um, so Cheryl, go ahead and get started with you. Sure, I'll go real quick on that. So I actually spent 13 years at Salesforce. Started as an engineer, uh, was with the Salesforce.com for about eight and a half years before moving to Salesforce.org. So at Salesforce.org, I grew up a team of about, uh, started at about six engineers to 100, all distributed, mostly working from home. And we build products for nonprofits and educational institutions. And then in September, I left that comfy job and went to a startup. Uh, and I'm growing a distributed uh, remote team. Uh, starting at six, we're at about 20. Uh, and our, you know, and we're focused on stress and burnout, so it's, it's nice to be able to walk the walk. <laughs> I'm Sid, I'm co-founder, CEO at uh, GitLab. Before GitLab, I had a few other companies. The most interesting one to talk about is where we built recreational submarines. I mean, <laughs> U-Boat Works still, still sells the most recreational submarines every year. Um, with GitLab, uh, it got the project, it's an open source project, it got started by my co-founder in the Ukraine. He was living in a house without running water, but his biggest priority in life is having better collaboration software at work. <laughs> but they didn't have money for it and they wanted to host it themselves, so we made that. Uh, 300 people joined him, I saw the project, I thought, hey, there, there's a business there. And uh, I sent him an email like, hey, do you mind if I start commercializing your project? with the implied subtext of you're not gonna get anything and he sent an email back, that's totally fine, just make it more popular, which I thought was great. And a year later he tweeted out, I want to work on GitLab full time. And we agreed on a price, I went to the local Western Union money office and they said, you wanna wire money to the Ukraine from the Netherlands? Do you know this person or is this someone you met over the internet? <laughs> uh, so that's how we uh, got in business together. GitLab is, uh, when, we came to the, when I came to the US, it was nine people. We fit in one house and one car in Mountain View during Y Combinator. But now we're uh, 500 people in more than 50 countries uh, without uh, a headquarter. That's great. Uh, my name is Mike Davidson. I am head of partnerships and community at Envision, um, a design prototyping company, a uh, software hopefully uh, people in this room use. Uh, we may be the largest all remote company in the world. We're pretty close. It's somewhere, it's us and automatic. We're sort of eight. We're somewhere between 800 and 850 people at any given time. Um, no offices anywhere. Even our CEO works out of his apartment in Brooklyn. Um, so this is the first time that I've been in a remote situation. I've never been a remote employee before. I've been there for about seven months, so it's a new situation for me. I'm a designer by trade. Uh, I, got my, I got my start in print design. Uh, then I moved over to interactive design, worked at ESPN, Disney, started a company called Newsvine back in the day, um, invented a font technology called Cipher um, that maybe some people in this room have used. Uh, and then I uh, built a design team at Twitter uh, in San Francisco several years ago, worked there for about three and a half years, and then got, I wouldn't say I got to the burnout stage, but I got close enough where I wanted to like, leave my job and move back up to Seattle and take two and a half years off, which is what I did. Um, so uh, I took a nice two and a half year vacation, and now I'm at Envision, and I'm excited to, uh, to tell everybody what I've learned about remote work. Mm. Yeah, I'm really interested in getting into that a little bit later because uh, both Cheryl and you have taken sabbaticals and I want to talk about the importance of rest and yes. how important that is for creativity. Uh, but Cheryl, let's go ahead and get started with you. What is your definition of burnout? So when I think about burnout, so I actually suffered burnout about five years ago. And when I think about it, it is, you know, it sort of manifests as um, inability to get a good night's sleep, uh, being really tired, being grouchy, being irritable. Uh, maybe having sort of physical manifestations. I had a physical manifestation when I get really stressed out, I get like eczema, and I had it erupt sort of all over my face during that period, so my body was just screaming, you're burnt out. And I think in particular at startups, and being at one now, um, 
you know, startup burnout is about trying to do too much with too little and then not necessarily having the tools in place to be able to kind of manage that mm -hmm. um, for sure. Yeah, and that uh, Keith Raboy, another guest on my podcast, he talked about the importance of um, having good outputs for your input. So if you keep on putting inputs in without getting outputs, that's a key sign that you're probably experiencing exactly. burnout. And then Sid, uh, you mentioned on our, on our earlier podcast that you had a stressful situation, maybe not burnout, but there was sort of a physiological thing that happened. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, at a certain point, I was pretty stressed out. Uh, I had to uh, let go of an executive um, who was otherwise like doing great, um, but it wasn't a fit for the business. And I was super stressed out about the situation. And it caused me to tense up. I sat like this behind my computer. And at a certain point, I, uh, I couldn't mo look left or right anymore. My, wow. like my neck totally tensed up. They thought I went to the massage and they thought I was joking when I said how, how much I could turn left and right. To make matters worse, I also was walking very little because we're all remote. I did everything from my apartment. And there's a condition where your feet start hurting. Mm -hmm. If the soles of my feet hurt, like I walked on my hands, like I couldn't walk for more than like 100 meters. Mm -hmm. And then my repetitive strain injury also started playing up, which is always like a bit of a boundary condition. So I, I felt like my body was like just letting me down. Like mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. I really had to learn how to separate I'm not responsible for the result. Like, it's a startup. I'm responsible for kind of how I deal with the things. And like, I'm responsible for my actions, but I cannot on my own be responsible for the result. There's a lot of things that factor into that. Mm -hmm. And I had to make that distinction and uh, get more comfortable with stuff not being the, the way it should be. Mm -hmm. So a key thing to essentially remember is to know what you can and can't do, basically, with what you are responsible for and what you aren't Yeah, the, don't, don't make your responsibility bigger than it is. Although you're the CEO, you're responsible for everything at the company. Uh, there's also a bit of stoicism where the world will fire things mm -hmm. at you. You, cannot, you can only be responsible for how you react to them, not that they happened in the first place. Absolutely. I think it's I think it's really interesting to hear everybody's different definitions of burnout. Because um, I, I was having a one-on-one -on -one with one of my uh, designers this morning, and I told him, "Hey, I'm doing this you know panel on burnout today. Do you have any good burnout stories? Um, what's burnout?" Uh, and he was like, "Well, are you talking about burnout or are you talking about fatigue? Because those are those are two different things to me." He said, "Like fatigue is generally what you feel. You you feel like you're getting burned out, but actually you're just getting fatigued." And it's interesting to hear. Like his definition of burnout was like. You, when you get to the point that you can't actually do any work anymore and you don't want to do any more work anymore. So your creativity is sapped, your energy is, is sapped. It's, it goes far beyond just being tired at work. So like, I think when people colloquial, colloquially refer to, refer to burnout, sometimes they're just talking about, I'm bored with my job or I'm a little tired. <laughs> and like, what I'm hearing from you two, like, it's interesting because it's like physical symptoms, right? And so like, I think that's a really good kind of line to draw. Like, if you're, if you're feeling physical symptoms from, from the work that you're doing, like, it's time to kind of step back and, and look at why you're feeling that way. Yeah, yeah and I actually looked up the, uh, a definition by WebMD of burnout, and they also talked a lot about alcohol use, if you're using alcohol a lot to, to kind of like stop Highly recommend stress. that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Great yeah. burnout avoider. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Instant energy. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, Mike, I'd love, I'd love to talk more about like uh, um, triggers. Like, what are your stress triggers, if you have any? Or yeah, I, I think like I'm a pretty low stress guy, honestly. Like, I as I've gotten older, I've gotten less stressed out as a person. I think as a high schooler, I was like clinically stressed. I was like a really bad kid, got suspended from school all the time, like borderline criminal, honestly. Um, and then when I got to college, it was like, all right, I'm in control of my life a little bit more. Like, all right, this, this feels a little bit better. And then like with each, with each new job that I've taken, I think I've just become more chill. Um, I think some of that is just general like rotting of the brain, honestly. Like I think when, when, you get, when you get older, you're, you know, music doesn't sound quite as good anymore. Um, the drugs aren't as fun as, <laughs> anymore as they used to be. Um, but but the, the, the upside of that is the, the, the lows don't hit you as much anymore, at least for me either. Like, I feel like I, 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 live, I live more, I have like more ballast in my life, right? Like, I don't allow the lows to affect me as much as I used to. And I also, unfortunately, probably don't allow the highs to affect me as much anymore. So I think that, like, as you go through life and you have all these stressful experiences, especially early in your career, like maybe you're doing your first startup, you may think like, this is gonna kill me. And like really, it's probably not gonna kill you, but it's gonna teach you 
coping skills for every other job that you have for the rest of your life. And, and you're going to get to the point where like nothing scares you anymore. I think that's the goal, really, is like to get to a point in your career where like you're never surprised and nothing scares you anymore. Um, but in, in terms of like triggers for me, I don't know. Like it always freaks me out a little bit when I know that there are teams at the company that are not aligned. So if I know like Eng is off working on something over here and design is working off on something wor working on something totally different and they don't even want to get to the same end state, like I just see that like train wreck happening in advance and it really kind of like stresses me out. So like lack of alignment, I think, within teams and around the company is sort of my biggest like stressor, mm. I would say. So Sid, I want to take that to you. How would you um, kind of establish uh, uh, alignment with your teams? How do you work on that for your teams? The, the first thing is to prevent alignment as much as possible, like prevent the need for alignment. Mm. So not prevent alignment, uh, but the need for alignment. So uh, we've taken great care to uh, make sure that uh, a certain functions are have a clearly defined non-overlapping responsibility. For example, our uh, sales development representatives, they do kind of outbound marketing, they approach people, whether they're interested in GitLab. Many people place them in sales, which makes sense because they are great future account representatives. So they're kind of a talent pool for that. They need to be close to the, uh, to the, the account people. But what they're really creating is creating pipeline. And the creating pipeline is a, a marketing job. And marketing should be able to make that trade off. Am I going to create pipeline by purchasing more ads or by doing, hiring more SDRs? And if you put that in the same function, they can make that trade off without having to consult with another function. So that's the first thing, like wherever you can, don't have the need. Then of course, it's very important that the company as a whole is aligned. Uh, if, you, if you look, uh, if you Google GitLab OKRs, you'll find our OKRs and see how we try to make sure that that's, uh, everyone is working on similar initiatives for the quarter that support each other. Another thing is what we do is stable counterparts. A lot of companies have kind of dotted lines um, where you're kind of reporting to this person, but also kind of to that person. We want to be super clear that you have only one boss. So you can Google GitLab org chart. You can find our entire org chart. There's only a single line allowed. Mm -hmm. But what we do try to do is then make sure that although the designers report to a design manager, or in our case, we call them UXers, they report to a UX manager, they tend to work with the same engineers. So everywhere we try to have stable counterparts, and if you Google GitLab product categories, you'll find, like, we've def find many different teams. I think we have probably 30 teams or something defined there now, and in every, um, are different groups, and in every team, there's like people are either all part of uh, such a group, or they they are the UX person that helps the people that make version control. So, if people are always dealing with the same counterpart, there's much more opportunity for trust and trade-offs and context and communication. And it seems like transparency is a huge way to, that you guys uh, kind of establish alignment al among the company as a whole too. You guys have these uh, company meetings, like all hands meetings all through YouTube basically, right? Yeah, so uh, for example, we wanna keep everyone informed on what's going on in the company and four times a week we do a group conversation where someone has a big slide deck about what's going on in, in that function. It can be finance, can be sales, can be an engineering uh, function. and they don't present the slide deck. They can record a video up front if they want, but then we spent 25 minutes with a Google Doc where people wrote down their questions and they answered those questions. That's how we spend our time in that meeting. And like about half of them are uh, live streamed to YouTube in public. So if you Google GitLab unfiltered, you'll find the channel and it has like multiple posts every day. And about half of them you can only find if you're locked in because there's some confidential information like customer names and things like that that we're not, uh, we have to consult with someone else before we can make it public, so uh, we keep it private. Mm. I just want to plus one your statement on stable teams. Like I think there are a lot of companies out there who have the opposite mentality of that. I totally agree with, with your philosophy on that. There are companies that think that 
tech workers should be inter interchangeable robots where you should be able to just kind of like move this engineer over here, move this designer over here, move this PM over here. They should all be able to work with each other. And like my experience has been like you lose a lot of time by doing that. Like the, the trust that it takes time for a team to build trust among, amongst themselves. And if you're going to split people up every three months and make them work with different people, you've just lost all of that trust that you've built over those three months. And so we can't treat our coworkers like robots. We have to treat them like human beings. Um, and I think that is still, that's a philosophy that I think is still undecided, especially in this area of the world. I think another thing I'm not pointing at Amazon. I'm pointing at, I'm pointing at this area, the tech, the tech world. Yeah. I think another thing what we're seeing is we want people, especially remote, to be a manager of one, take responsibility for their own work. Yeah. So we don't do project managers. There are no project managers. It's up to the people in the team to do that together. And if that doesn't work, we see it as a problem with the, mm -hmm. the people that have to work together. Mm -hmm. um, but we're not going to install a boss, because then you get a cross-functional team. And if you have a cross-functional boss, that means your boss doesn't really understand your work. That means your boss cannot assess your output. And that means your boss is going to steer by input. And that's what we want to avoid. We want people to be uh, valued according to their output, no, not how many hours they put in or how late they stay up. So what's, what's your thoughts on that show? Coming from a, you know, you've got experience in a big company and then a smaller, a smaller company. Yeah, now, yeah, uh, I, I used to sort of have this um, issue where uh, I had some colleagues at, at, at the big company I worked at that I would say that thought of people as um, washers or dryers or washer-dryer combination. You know, it was just, <laughs> everyone was just like a robot that you could kind of put in place and that I, definitely not the point of view that I sort of approach my work and my work with engineering teams because we all bring our whole selves to the office every day. Um, and I try to create, uh, so what gets me very excited is when uh, every individual can really bring their authentic selves and be who they are and feel like respected and understood and loved and cared for and then produce amazing work together and you know do great things. That's sort of my goal. So I'm a bit touchy-feely as far as engineering managers go, um, all within the bounds of what's acceptable, of course. Um, <laughs> But that's sort of my, my approach. And I have, I think by fact of being distributed, you have an opportunity to have a very diverse team, like a lot of diversity of thought, uh, backgrounds, you know, religious backgrounds, et cetera. So I actually love that challenge and um, work really hard to make sure the team, for example, if, uh, if someone is like afraid of someone else or say, um, put off by someone or maybe they had like a slack fight uh, and there's like an escalation. It's always just like, listen, I want you to meet together, get to know each other, like understand each other. Like, <coughs> I know you're all like each one of you I've spent time with are good people, well intentioned. If you just get to know each other, everything's going to be OK. Mm -hmm. And then after you do that, if you're still having issues, come to me. Um, but yeah, the slack fights, we got to stop, right? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, sure. one one like really easy thing to do to, uh, if your company sort of, sort of is on the like treating people like robots side of the fence is stop using the word resources when yeah. you're talking about human yeah. beings. Yeah. Um, don't ask for engineering resources. Ask for <laughs> engineers. Don't ask for design resources. Ask for designers. It's a really simple thing, and it gets people thinking in terms of human beings. Uh, if you want resources, you want books. You want machines. You want like inanimate objects. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if you're asking for more people, ask for more people. That's a really good point. Um, so uh, Thrive's mission, Thrive Global's mission is to promote well-being and create a mindful uh, workplace. Uh, what does it mean to be mindful in a business context? Sure, sure. So, you know, so at Thrive Global, we are we're sort of a you know a, a media technology company that's really trying to bring science back behavior change towards ending the stress and burnout epidemic. Um, you know, globally, uh, so it's a, it's a pretty big problem. And uh, so what's exciting is my team, you know, the team that I'm growing right now is really focused on building the platform and the apps that are going to drive behavior change. Uh, so what we're doing is actually pretty tricky, you know, getting people to take actions and steps that are good for them is generally, you know, I think there's like a number of about 10% compliance with, with such uh, programs and apps and things. Because, you know, it's easy for us to kind of slide back into what is our normal um, status quo. So it's an interesting and compelling challenge for us. And then we're bringing this to companies where we're trying to kind of walk the walk and live what it means to thrive. So we talk about it as 
thriving at Thrive. And it's not about being chill or laid back. It's, you know, the message is for people, when this is what resonates with me and I'm excited about, because it's not that I'm trying to kind of be super laid back. Like, I want to make stuff happen, but I want to make stuff happen not at the expense of my health, not at the expense of my happiness, not at the expense of my relationship with my daughter. You know, there's a lot of caveats to that. Um, so mindful business for us is about looking at the data, looking at the science that shows that stress and burnout leads to poor decision making, um, it leads to uh, lack of employee engagement, you know, attrition, health issues. Um, so it's kind of stop the, time to stop the madness is the way I look at it. Um, tactically for us, you know, we practice mindful meetings. So no tech in meetings unless you're the presenter or you're dialed in remotely. Uh, so all laptops are closed, phones are put away. You know, we're, we take a lot of notes. I like to draw, so it actually kind of works for me. Uh, we practice, um, oh, what was the other, uh, mindful meetings. Uh, mindful moments, so we're encouraged to uh, speak up when we're kind of overwhelmed or feeling burnt out. Uh, encouraged to like take a moment in the day to, uh, you know, breathe deeply. Um, we practice mindful communication, so this one is really important. Uh, we call it compassionate directness. Um, so it means sort of just like airing stuff immediately uh, and not, you know, thinking in the back of your head like, oh, that was really dumb, and then go telling your friend at the water cooler like, ugh, so-and-so did something dumb. Um, you just kind of say, hey, that thing you did, and, and give the feedback. But it needs to come from a place of compassion and care, and that's where trust comes in, right? And that if you, in order to give those messages to people, you have had to invest in building a trusting relationship. So yes, having kind of teams that know how to work together and trust each other is really, I think, important for performance. You, yeah, you bring up a good point, is that I think we're all here to essentially create something of value, and how do we create something of value without uh, losing ourselves and losing our health? Uh, and so, uh, Sid, could you talk a little bit how you've created this, this massive company, you and, you and your partners have created this massive company, how have you kind of walked that line of making sure that you take care of yourself so that you don't kill the go golden goose? Yeah. Um, I, I, we, we want managers of one, so we, we want people to, um, to manage themselves, their, their attention. Um, we do some things uh, maybe a bit different. For example, in meetings, uh, ours are almost always um, uh, via Zoom meeting. Um, we use Google Docs extensively to kind of whiteboard together. There's a lot of indentation. But for example, we also make it explicit that you don't have to be in that meeting. Like, if you just want to lurk in that meeting and do something else, do email, mm -hmm. that's totally fine. We don't require your attention. We're not the boss of your attention. That's up to you where you place your attention. And we don't think it's bad if someone asks you a question and you say, oh, can you repeat? I was doing something else. Mm -hmm. um, I think in general, there's, there's too much time spent in meetings and wasted in meetings. I think one of the great things about remote meetings is that you can do something else if the, that part of the meeting isn't uh, relevant to you. And in the end, it's about effectiveness. Like, if you can do more with fewer hours, you're going to have more hours in your own time. Um, someone sent me a Slack message at DM this morning uh, who worked at a company. He worked at a company before that you'd think, based on the product they'd sell, that you do, they do remote really well. But he quit that company, came to us because he thought we did remote better. And he, was, he wanted to confirm that, yes, mm -hmm. that was the case. He has more time with his family now than he's ever had. And I think that is the flexibility to kind of take time off work, take time off when there, there is a need for that, and be flexible in that is really great. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday, my, uh, my, the EA that supports me, the that supports me, um, C said, can I take tomorrow afternoon off? And I said, we have to call. Because like, I said, why are you asking me this? Like, all our directions are super clear. You're the boss of your own yeah. time. You, it's fine that you inform me that you take time off, but why, it's really bad that you're asking me. She's like, oh yeah, sorry, I, I know, but it's, it was so different at my last job. Oh. So it, it takes 
takes a while to get used to it. I think especially like the competing on working longer hours is something very ingrained, especially in North America. So for example, in our thank you channel, we say you can thank people, but you can never thank them for working outside of office hours because we don't want people to compete on that. And it happens from time to time. It's not that nobody ever works outside of office hours. Don't thank them for that in a public forum because that's, yeah. we don't want that example to be set. Yeah, and that's a really good point, which is essentially we've got to start measuring output as opposed to input, which you've mentioned a couple of times. And that's something that goes against a lot of what we're taught here, which is especially in San Francisco, which is uh, measure input. I'm going to basically signal to people that I'm, that I'm putting all this input in uh, when it doesn't really matter as much. Um, Mike, do you have any thoughts on that? And yeah, I have, I have a couple. Um, one was it, was it was interesting hearing you talking about like not working um, you know after hours too much. We actually we actually keep Sabbath hours um, at Envision. So basically, the entire company closes at at 12 p.m. every Friday, um, and you technically can do work I guess after that, but like pretty much nobody's doing work from 12 p.m. Friday to sundown um, Saturday. Um, Sabbath is generally you know, viewed, viewed as a Jewish thing, but like, you don't need to be Jewish to observe the Sabbath. And like, it's, I think it's becoming a, a more acceptable, um, interesting thing to try if you're looking to sort of like change up your work week a little bit. Um, so it's been interesting for us. Like, it's definitely a perk. Like, when, people, when we talk to people about joining the company, we eventually keep Sabbath hours, people are like, wow. I've never even heard of that. Um, so it's, it's useful for us. It kind of gives everybody uh, the last half of Friday off, which is really cool too, especially in the summertime. Um, so that's like one suggestion. Uh, I also, the other interesting thing about meetings too, you mentioned, um, it's interesting coming from a conventional company where you're working on site and you have so many meetings all day, moving to a remote environment that makes heavy use of Slack. There's so many times where I find myself, like I'm typing out, an, I'm typing out a, a recurring, I'm typing out a, an invitation to a recurring meeting that I'm about to start with a group of people, and I'm going to say, hey, let's like touch base every two weeks about this thing. And then I, like, I get to the end of the thing before I actually create the meeting. I'm like, why am I even creating this meeting? I don't, we don't need to meet every two weeks. We can just like, give each other updates in Slack. Mm -hmm. And you don't realize how many times you are just like, creating these rituals of meeting that possibly aren't necessary with the technology that we have today. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with Slack. Like there are times that I love it, you know, for things like that, and there are times that I absolutely hate it. I have no idea if it's making me a more effective or less effective leader. Um, but that is one thing that it does that, that it does really well is it, it it eliminates the need for some of these ritual meetings that we get bogged down with a lot at work. What are your thoughts, Cheryl, on meetings and at Thrive, and particularly because you half of your team here is in San Francisco and then half of your team is in New York, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say we use meetings mostly to connect, um, you know, as because uh, we are kind of these uh, various groups um, and we kind of come together. And the idea is, uh, you, you know, you opt into the meeting, you can't opt out, but wanting to give your full attention. So uh, a lot of the times we're just surfacing problems. Mm. Uh, and working on problems together and get, getting perspectives. So there's not your typical status updates. Uh, we don't really do that. Uh, those are more kind of sent out and we make use of Slack um, and then, you know, and just regular sort of stand-ups and things like that. So we, we try not to have too many meetings either. Um, we started to adopt the like Bezos memo uh, um, idea because they're, you know, they're given the media aspect of the business, uh, there are a lot of writers. And so we tend to kind of write everything out. So not a lot of slides, more memo style. And that's actually been kind of nice for me. Um, you, can, you can really put your thoughts all out on paper, you know, send it out to your colleagues. They can kind of read it and think about it, get questions prepared. And then you can have a very quick discussion as opposed to what you were describing, right? Where the traditional thing where the person sits there and presents the slides and reads from the slides. And then, you know, you spend an hour kind of being presented at, how valuable is that? Mm, so we're yeah. trying to shortcut that experience as well um, and really ha use the time more for discussion and helping each other out. Mm. Somebody, I read a tip once from somebody that said like, you should rename all of your meetings to review. So basically everything is a review. And if you have nothing to review, you have nothing to meet about. Yeah. And it like forces you to have an agenda. It forces you to think about like what meetings are actually interesting and, and which ones aren't. I haven't tried that myself, but it was, it was interesting. <laughs> So I just want to ask the audience, a raise of hands, uh, how many of you guys are either in a remote work or are considering remote work? So yeah, more than, more than half. That's really interesting. Uh, and how many of you have experienced burnout? So maybe 
one fourth. That's really interesting. Uh, so then, um, uh, Sid, I want to talk to you about hiring practices. Maybe we can get some good examples of, of hiring practices uh, for remote companies and how that works specifically in, in, in GitLab. Yeah, um, I think a great thing about remote is that you can hire everywhere. Uh, we certainly try to do that. Um, we, um, one, one of the contentious things is sometimes, what do you pay? Do you pay local rates or do you pay everyone the same rate? Uh, we think paying market rates, so local rates, is the better thing. Otherwise, you're probably overpaying some people, underpaying other people, and both have problems. Mm -hmm. um, it's a big advantage to hire any, like 90% of the world. Um, the, in San Francisco, in the hiring centers, it's super, super hard to find people. All the big companies are opening satellite offices in all the usual places like Berlin. But for a lot of people, if you want to live somewhere in the mountains, an hour or two away from the big town, your options are way more limited. Mm -hmm. And for those people, like the option to work at like a, a fast-going startup, we're one of the few options around. So we have a very great proposition. So it's a question of reaching a lot of people with that message. Um, so also, I think, although that succeeds and we get like 13,000 applications a quarter, we do augment that with reaching out to people. Most people, most great, a lot of great people are not actively searching. So we do have recruiters everywhere. But we also have recruiters in, in Russia, in Africa, like also in the less common places. What happens if one of your workers uh, uh, moves to another place that's cheaper, to like, you know, India or something like that? Yeah. So, um, they have to renegotiate with the company. We, don't, we do not owe them a contract. Mm -hmm. They can stay their intent, and we'll try to make an offer. Interesting. And so far, we've been able to make that work every single time, but it's not an entitlement, except for one thing. If someone wants to move to the Netherlands after working for us for a year, and they're not on a performance improvement plan, that is their right. And so, Mike, yeah, do you have anything to say about hiring? And yeah, hiring? I, I was curious to ask both of you, like, have you, you've been in a remote situation longer than me. Like, I have found that we have to hire generally pretty senior people. Um, not all principal level people necessarily, but like, it, it's hard for me to imagine managing a, like a very junior designer in a remote environment because I, I found that, at least in design, um, more junior people need to be checked in on every day, need personal, uh, you know, pers a lot more personal coaching, a lot more kind of like, you know, just in-person face-to-face time. And, you know, as, it's nice because like at a company like Envision, we have so many senior people that we've been able to hire because of what you said, you can hire all, all around the world. Um, but I also worry, like, what does that mean for all the younger, um, inex inexperienced people who are growing up as, you know, inexperienced engineers and experienced PMs and experienced uh, designers? Like, if the world is moving to like a mostly remote model, what is, where, where are their jobs? Like, is it, are, are they going to be kind of crowded out by the fact that we can now find really senior designers in the Ukraine and in Russia and in Israel and in, and in Hawaii, you know, wherever. Actually, Hawaii's probably very expensive. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, I, I, when I think back at, like, to the beginning stages of my career, like, I treasure the in-person relationships that I had with like, amazing you know, creative directors. And I think about what that would have looked like if I was talking to them remotely on a Zoom call and I don't know if I would have enjoyed it. I don't even know if I would have stayed in the field. So like, if we, if we really are building a, a world that is gonna be mostly remote or largely remote soon, how do we make sure that we're still bringing up our, our, the, the new generation of people into our field? I think um, we struggle with this, but I don't think for the remote reason. Uh, we were, uh, I was in such a debate on Twitter, I think two weeks ago, and, and someone from the company who saw it chimed in like he's had a better he, he learned more at GitLab quicker than at other companies. Mm -hmm. So I think you can totally learn people, uh, teach people remotely. The, the problem we face is that we're growing really, really fast. So engineering focus, engineers focused on product will grow from 200 to 500 this calendar year. That is like more than doubling. That's two and a half. That's, that's pretty rapid pace. Mm -hmm. And we find that we, due to that growth, that requires so much focus to, on hiring and other things that we're not able to have internships or junior people. Mm. Um, that's very sad right. because that's the biggest source of more diverse people into the industry, but also into our company. Yeah. So that's a big challenge. 
Uh, so on one hand, I hope the growth doesn't slow down, but when it slows down, this will want to be one of the great things that comes through it that we'll have more time for that. Mm -hmm. And so Cheryl, you're, you're, you're in a, a smaller uh, team uh, now, and you guys are hiring, right? Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on, on this hiring situation? Yeah, I mean, similar, let's see, because there were a lot of different topics. Let me think of what was, is more relevant. I mean, similar for us just due to our size, it's hard to bring on more junior people, and I do miss that, having come from a big company. Uh, we could, you know, I think we were having hundreds of interns every summer, and I love that, uh, and just sort of like growing our own talent was just so satisfying. You know, I had interns that had started at Salesforce who ended up, you know, still being with the company a decade later, you know, principal engineers, CTOs, like things like that. And that's very gratifying to, to see people grow in such an amazing way. So I'm hoping that we'll get there, that we'll continue to grow. Uh, and I'll have the opportunity to, to bring on folks that are newer in their career. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm, I, I, I see a lot of benefits to remote hiring and uh, remote work prime for us, um, you know, for when I was at salesforce.org and now at Thrive Global, uh, you know, there are so many tools to be able to kind of do the interview and, uh, and, and sort of understand where people are. Um, you know, communication skills are really key. I love your, this notion of manager of one. Uh, we really look for folks that are going to be able to kind of manage their time, that are very motivated, uh, you know, communicative, diligent, um, you know, hardworking, humble, like these are some of the qualities. And we've had a lot of success just bringing on folks from like all over that are very productive, um, you know, and, and, and doing great. So I think I see only benefits. And they get to also benefit from just sort of like being out. Well, there's pros and cons. You know, you're sort of outside the kind of office swirl that can happen, um, which can help for focus in, in productivity. But then sometimes you miss out on that, on that office connection. So we do try to bring everyone together Periodically, we just had all the engineers in town a few weeks ago, uh, you know, from all over. So that's helpful. So you guys do in-person kind of uh, um, uh, quarterly um, yeah. meetups, yeah. yeah. And Sid, you, you guys do the similar thing, right? You guys have uh, kind of whole team meetups in a specific location to get that yeah. in-person. We do that every nine months. We bring everyone together for a week. Uh, we do it in a, a fun location. Um, like last one was in, in, in South Africa, in Cape Town. We had it in Crete. Next one will be in New Orleans. And Thank that, you for giving me ideas, because our last two were in Phoenix in LA. <laughs> so uh, those are next on my list now. That's Great. amazing. Cape Town. Cape Hell Town yeah. was amazing. Um, we try the, the only time you can use a projector is at the opening and the closing ceremony. During the week, the only people who can use a projector are um, our customers who sometimes attend, oh, oh. but it's we don't try to make you sit through presentations the whole day. So for two, three days, we do excursions. We go visit like the the, the scenic spots, uh, go go explore the town, and then for three days we do kind of an unconference, and the topics are not contributed by m management. It's mostly like individual contributors who propose things, and then people kind of vote or say what they want to attend. There's no things you have to attend. You're free to attend what you want. And it's to, to focus that week, not on like rolling out a new sales plan or stuff like that, but focus on creating those connections between uh, people that they can then carry in uh, to the new year and then do all the other stuff we do to promote connections. For example, we encourage people to do coffee chats where they just plan 25 minutes on someone's calendar. And we, we have a daily uh, breakout uh, call where you chat with the same group, but you talk about life outside of work to, to make, to, to serve as kind of an, an, a boost to those informal connections. Mm, that's really interesting. So Mike, uh, I've read a lot of your blog posts and uh, one of them talks about you, talk, to, talk about yourself as an extrovert and you were worried about making the switch to, to a remote thing uh, yeah. because it seems like that would be a place where an introvert would thrive. How, can you talk about some of the challenges you've faced and how you've dealt with them? Yeah, yeah, I mean, I like being around people. I mean, I like being in rooms full of people. I like being in offices, what can I say? Uh, and so I never really wanted to work remotely. And when I was interviewing at Envision, 
every single person that I interviewed with said the same thing, including Hillary in the back of the room. She said, mm -hmm. you, you aren't going to think, you aren't, you think you're not, you think it's not going to work and you think it's, you're not going to like it, but three weeks in, you're never going to want to work anyway, <laughs> any other way again. And it's true. Like it, when you can, sh when you can chop off an entire portions of your day that you would have spent like driving to work. I mean, I shower five minutes before my first meeting of the day, like <laughs> probably too much information. Uh, <laughs> but like, it, it is amazing how much of your life you can get back when you're working remotely, but you do. But to your point, like you do sort of miss that human connection. And there's only so much of that human connection that you can get like through Zoom calls. So, uh, you know, my, my biggest advice for that is like, you got to change up your surroundings. Like we have a, we have a, a, a policy at Envision where we give everybody $100 coffee cards every month and they just reset to 100 bucks every month. And, and the idea is like we want to encourage you to change up your, your, your work surroundings. We don't want you working at home all the time. We want you working at home sometimes. We want you working at the WeWorks that we have around different cities sometimes. We want you working at your local coffee shop so you can meet local people in your neighborhood that you don't know. We want you, meet, we want you going across town if you feel like going across town and working at another coffee shop. I feel like you can still, you can still get that kind of human connection if you, if you don't like, make yourself a shut-in mm. <laughs> inside, inside your own house. So like, I think if you're thinking about working remotely and your, your idea of working remotely is I'm just gonna like, go, to my, go into my basement and spend <laughs> eight hours a day there and then come up and be done, like that, that's gonna be miserable. Uh, so I don't think that that's a healthy, like, a healthy environment at all. But, but I will say like, to, you know, to Sid's point, like we do the, the yearly uh, all hands meetings as well. We call them IRLs in real life. Uh, and they're, they're so fun because you feel like you're meeting 800 of your long lost friends. Um, and it's just a week of like connection and, and fun. And you, you say, there was a time um, that I said, this was a, a few weeks ago, and I said to myself like, wow, I wish I could work in physical proximity to these people every day. Wouldn't it be great? And then my next thought was like, none of these people would be working at this company if it, if it wasn't a remote company. I wouldn't be talking to somebody from Nigeria. I wouldn't be talking to somebody from China. I wouldn't be talking to somebody from, um, you know, Indonesia. I wouldn't be talking from to, to all of these people who come from all around the world because we, we these people wouldn't work here if we lived in San, or if we were located in San Francisco or another or another company. So you sort of got to like take the good with the bad. It's definitely not all good. Uh, I also I don't know how you how you two feel about this, but like I I have learned to tolerate slash sometimes like video meetings. I always hated them. Now I kind of like them, but I, I'm like binary. If I'm as soon as I reach my like third hour. <laughs> of video meetings in the day, I'm like, this is terrible. Yeah. This sucks. <laughs> this I don't want to do any more of these. Um, so it, everybody has their own kind of like appetite, I guess, for video meetings. Mine is maybe like two and a half, three hours. Uh, but, but I think that's a large part of this panel too, is like none of the advice that you get from any of us is going to be universal. Everybody's different. Uh, so don't go into, you know, don't, don't go into this thinking that there's like a silver bullet that's going to work for everybody in this room. And that also applies to stress as well. Yeah, <laughs> like, totally. Yeah, nobody's stresses are the same. So totally. It's a totally individual thing. So I wanted to open up to you, Cheryl, before we start taking questions to the audience. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts on this kind of introvert, extrovert, uh, how to uh, adapt to remote work? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, for me, I think regardless of introvert, extrovert, uh, what's important for me is, like I was saying earlier, just creating this opportunity for everyone to kind of show up as their authentic selves. Um, I've actually, you know, when I first started in my last experience having a remote team and I had a lot of remote direct reports, which was new for me, I thought it would be a little bit more challenging in sort of maintaining the relationship. Um, but I've got, I, I, I've, I found some ease in creating connection through video that I didn't expect. I spent a lot of my time on video calls. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with it. You know, I, that's just sort of my, I've, it's been many years now. and have been able to like have these amazing moments. Like I had one moment where with someone, it was a, it, I was new to the company, I'm on the team, and, and I'm, I'm having a, a video chat with an engineer who is upset. And we're supposed, supposed to talk about architecture, um, and, I w and there was getting this like back at me. And started to talk about architecture, and then I was like, okay, this isn't gonna go anywhere. I need to figure out what was going on. Uh, and so I just sort of like pierced through this screen and was like, okay, what's going on? Like, I need to know. And then I always, whenever I get into like a deep conversation with someone, I try to imagine there's like a bowl in front of me because I don't want to, I'm a little bit empathetic, so I have a tendency to, to take on other people's like feelings and stress. I used to do that more. I do that less. I'm even good at it 
with my daughter, which is surprising, because I used to get, like, she'd be anxious and I'd feel anxious. But So I'd, I'd sort of imagine this bowl and just, like, put it in there. You know, it's not my my thing to take, but I want I want that person to be able to kind of, like, put it all out there and unload. And so within 20 minutes, we had this, like, absolutely cathartic conversation. Like, I got it all out. You know, there were tears. Like, we got, we had breakthroughs. And I have, you know, and then I had gone months working with this individual, met them once in person. But we are at this place in our relationship where there's, like, you know, trust and connection. And um, they're in a much better place. You know, the team's in a much better place. So. Uh, introvert, extrovert, I just feel like uh, there is this, this ability to kind of connect with people regardless of whether you're right there or you're through video. Mm. Um, and I, you know, I love extroverts and I love introverts and like introverts for me are so fun because it's like a, cr like a nut to crack. Uh, so, you know, it's like, what's going on? Everything's cool. I'm like, mm, is everything cool? You know, like, I'm going to figure you out. Um, whereas, you know, extroverts tend to kind of, you know, we just go, you know, it's like, uh, we just chat until the time is up. Um, so yeah, I just, you know, for me, I think a lot about how to just create that human connection mm -hmm. because I love it. Like, it used to just be something I wanted to do because I like to get to know people and, and understand them and care about them. And then I realized it was my superpower, you know, mm -hmm. and what actually made me successful as a leader. So now I just own it, um, and, and, and that's what I, I like to do. That's very cool. Yeah. Can I say one, one other thing about video calls and introversion? We, we were having a, one of our regular diversity and inclusion meetings the other day, and we were talking about like how technology has affected how people communicate with each other at Envision. And some of the people around the room said something really interesting, which is like, when I've worked at tech companies in the past and we're all in a meeting together, it's the people with the loudest voices and the people who are the most extroverted who do most of the talking. Because not only do they raise their voices when they have something to say, but they also do like subtle things like kind of leaning in and just sort of like let like, these cues that mm -hmm. kind of let everybody else know, like, I'm going to talk next, right? And when you're using only video conferencing, there are no, none of those cues. Everybody is just behind a flat screen and everybody's volume is exactly the same. And so it's because of a, because of a, a, a sort of a, a problem, I wouldn't, a shortcoming of the technology, it sort of created a bit of an equalizer amongst people who maybe don't feel as comfortable talking in, in, in your traditional aggressive tech company yeah. kind of way. We always try to have like a running Slack channel. Well, this is something new we've been experimenting with. My last team always had like a vibrant chat going on anytime there was a presentation happening. Uh, comments, questions, like, you know, kudos, whatever. And so we're implementing that now for exactly that reason. Because even on video, some people, you can see them, and I'll even find myself like, is this a good time to, yep. ooh, 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 you know, and then yep. you can just avoid that. So we always have someone monitor the Slack channel, and then if someone has a question, they'll, they'll interrupt the person. That's um, smart. I yeah. get in trouble with that because whenever I use Slack during video meetings, everybody can see me smiling or yeah. la <laughs> laughing at whatever the back channel joke is, and I always get called out on it. Yeah. So I try, I try not to do that. But you know, if everyone can see it, then if it's If everyone like can see it, then it's yeah. different. That's true. Yeah. That's good point. DMs are really bad, um, mm -hmm. and back channels. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we encourage people to not use chat, uh, but use the Google Doc. So it has the agenda, and we fill out things as we go along. So if you, if you have a question, you note it in there. And you go on sequence, but sometimes the question is already answered by someone else. Mm -hmm. Someone adds a link to something. And then after the meeting, people can kind of go to that, see if the meeting's interesting because kind of all the Q and A is there, and then watch the recording or not watch it. So it's it's cool. be, by using a document, you can go back in time, forward in time, like which is way better than the linear structure. Yeah. Totally agree. Yeah. Try that out too. So we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. I got a whole bunch of questions here, really good questions. Um, and uh, the first one uh, is a, a great one, particularly uh, because we have Sid here. Uh, what was the thinking pattern on going all out on remote work from the very start? Yeah, w it was never supposed to happen <laughs> like this. Um, by default, Dimitri was in the Ukraine. I was in the Netherlands. Our first hire was in Serbia. So we were kind of remote by default. And people in the Netherlands came into my office, but they kind of stopped showing up because it's like a two hour commute and like, why do it? Um, never told them. They just stopped showing up, but kept doing their work. 
<laughs> and uh, during Y Combinator, they said, oh yeah, that remote works for engineering, but not for everything else. Uh, so we're like, well, one of our values is boring solutions, so we'll just get an office. We got an office, 12 put desks in it. And the first salesperson kind of came in three days and then stopped showing up as well. <laughs> so we're remote because people stopped showing up to the office. And, uh, <laughs> tru truancy by design. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I guess that's how most things get started, right? It's the kind of organic, organic nature of things. This is a really good question, uh, Cheryl. I want to ask you this: um, Can you burn out even if you're working on things that are very interesting and rewarding? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I try to only work on interesting and rewarding things, and I think burnout is possible. Um, you know, the way I think about it, it's like e even when you're really into something too, you'll have a tendency to you know, hold on to it. I use this metaphor a lot of like my, I have a dog who will like grab a toy and shake it. You know, I, that's how I s describe my day. It's like a dog grabbed, grabbed me and just shaking me all day. Um, and, and so in order for me, for example, to kind of be okay, be healthy, be happy with the reality of what my day is like, which is pretty intense, um, I have to kind of carefully bookend it with, you know, my rituals and my practices that I do the beginning of the day, at the end of the day, that helps me make sure I have a good sleep. If I don't do those things, um, all, all these ideas and the things I'm excited about, I'm wrestling with in the night. Like I literally am wrestling the ideas and like moving around um, because it's like, a, you know, it's mm. such an it's an active thing. And then I get really bad sleep, and then I feel crappy the next day. So I try to be really um, careful about how I start my day and how I end my day, knowing that I have a lot less control about everything that happens during the day. Um, generally, because everything I'm doing, I'm super excited about. So mm. it's a good problem. But if you don't kind of manage it, you can end up, you know, just getting, you know, tired and burnt out. And that's sort of was mm. what happened to me ultimately. Mm. That's a really good point. Um, so uh, let's ask uh, Mike. Uh, remote teams don't communicate by default. How how does Envision how has joining Envision um, kind of fostered a culture of communication? Hmm. How do they do it? Hmm. Well, there's little things uh, that I think go a long way sometimes. Like we. The first day I joined, I did my first video call, and I turned the video off because, like, you know, you don't need to see me, right? Like, you can just hear me. That's I, 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 I didn't understand why my face needed to be like part of this call um, because, like, conference calls that I was used to doing were just like you know generally phone calls. Um, and the first thing like somebody on the call did was say like, Mike, turn your video on. <laughs> and I was like, All right. And I turned my video on. They're like, At this company, like, we always have our video on. And like it's, it, it really makes a difference. I mean, having having your video on unless you're like driving or something like that um, really makes a difference in how you how you communicate with people. Seeing people's faces, being able to read what their expressions are, if you piss them off, if you excited them, um, it's really it's really um, it's really important. In fact, I remember when I had my first conference call with Amazon uh, with with you guys, uh, you had your video off. Like, I think everybody had their video off, and and uh, I was like, oh, that's the way I used to work. Like, let's all turn our video on. Um, so uh, like little things like that that you and also by the way like I sometimes somebody will ask me to like consult with a startup who's like thinking about you know going all remote and I'll talk to their founders and it's the same thing like we'll get on this call and they'll both have their video off I'm like guys yeah. video on come on <laughs> um, so little things like that like make a make a big difference like we are not trying to avoid each other we are trying to um, we're trying to simulate being together, and I think those those the te technologies that allow us to simulate being together will will get better and better over the next few years. Like we've, we're reaching an inflection point now where this is possible. Like, I don't know. You tell me. Like, would it be possible to run your either of your companies the way that you run them ten years ago? Like, I, I don't think we could do that. Even just video bandwidth alone. You know, like we've gotten to the point where like. Yeah, like stutter talk is kind of like a, a dialect of English a little bit. Like you've <laughs> got to understand what people are saying when you're missing a word or two every now and then. Mm -hmm. But it's usually pretty good, you know. Like it's it's usually pretty decent. And that wasn't the case like several years ago. So we're at this inflection point where like the technology is now just getting to the point where we're we're good enough where we can do this. Mm -hmm. And over the next like four or five years, it's just going to get better and better. So it it it's important to like take advantage of things like that. It's also important, however, to realize that when you are working in an all remote environment, when you call a meeting with somebody you are invading their home like you are like they're 
cats and dogs are in the background. <laughs> their, their spouses are in the background coming back in from a run or whatever. Um, their, their kids are running around sometimes. And like, it doesn't mean you can't do it, but it does make you kind of think twice sometimes about like, do I need to, um, do, I, do, do, you know, do I need to have this meeting or do I not? Many of our company, our calls start with someone showing off their baby yeah. or <laughs> getting their, their kids or, or their, their, their spouse involved. Yep. Uh, so in the last question we got, um, a really good question for Sid. What's the best way to stay on the same pe page when you and your co-founder are rarely in the same room? Yeah, it's, uh, it's the same thing with like basically all, all the reports. So um, make sure you have a call once a week. Um, go with all of my reports every week. Um, have written down goals about what's going to be achieved. And uh, for us, that's OKRs. And uh, we, every like three, four weeks, we go see what the status of the OKRs is. Mm. Uh, and uh, for most of my reports, uh, our executives, they will have dedicated meetings. So every month, we'll have a metrics meeting for sales, for marketing, for finance, for engineering. We review all their KPIs and all their OKRs and their progress. Uh, I think that's really important to stay, uh, stay aligned. Um, had some things are, are obvious, but like be available. Like I, I frequently have people reach out to me like, hey, can you help with this problem? I'm really stuck. Like I didn't get this that I asked for this. Um, I think there should be a low threshold to approach people. Mm -hmm. I uh, reviewed my calendar with Dan Levin today. Dan Levin is uh, the old COO of Box. He's now at Coastal Ventures, and they very nicely uh, made him available to, to help me He'll look at my agenda. And he noted two things. One, that I have very few standing meetings. Now, we don't think of meetings as invading people's home. Uh, <laughs> But we, we are reluctant to call a standing meeting for something which is never have a meeting about something that should have been an update in an issue tracker. Um, then for invading people home, two, two stories. We allow you to buy green screens. And with Zoom, you can have amazing yep. backgrounds. So that. there's yeah. a lot of fun. I one of those myself. <laughs> there's a plugin called Snap Camera where you can like make yourself tear and <laughs> barf rainbows and, and all the things. I use that from time to time. It's mm -hmm. super, super fun. Um, but uh, the other thing he noted in my calendar is that I wasn't doing skip levels. So that's something I'll be introducing. Mm. So uh, this is a really great panel. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come and, and share your knowledge. Um, we're about out of time now. Uh, the next discussion, we, we're going to talk about uh, I want to talk about technology and the way technology is going to evolve. I think that's a really interesting point. Um, and also, you guys, your questions were amazing. Um, I know Sid does a lot of Ask Me Anythings on, on YouTube, so I'm sure you can reach out to him. I don't want to offer, <laughs> offer yeah. that. But, uh, um, and uh, so I just want to end by how can people find you guys, find out more about what you're doing? Are you guys active on Twitter? Or, um? I'm semi sort of active on Twitter. I'd say more Instagram these days. Uh, but I am both places, and I do get notifications and whatnot, and LinkedIn too. Um, so all those spots. Cool. I'm active on Twitter. DM me, and I do a lot of these pick your brain meetings. It's a public live stream, so you have to be comfortable with that. But uh, I do them uh, a couple of times a week. Cool. I am uh, very active on Twitter, <laughs> usually after hours. Uh, <laughs> my username is Mike Industries, if you'd like to follow me, and my DMs are open. Thank you guys so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Stuart. Yep, thank thanks, you. Stuart.